top of the hour. Let's get started. My name is Paul Vixie, and I am glad to see that all of the seats are not empty. This is a rather boring topic for a lot of people in the world, um, but uh, not to you, and I appreciate that. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am responsible for an awful lot of CVEs. I used to write a lot of code. A lot of those CVEs are in a uh, package called Bind. Not a lot of the other ones are in a package called Cron, which I wrote, and which is probably what you'll see if you say man Cron on your laptop. Turns out Cron is for some mysterious reason also inside of all of your Android and iOS devices. So um, I, I, uh, I feel responsible for a lot of the email it has sent all of us over the years. Uh, I, I guess that makes me a spammer. But I've also done quite a bit of work in DNS. Um, I started a company, Internet Systems Consortium, back in the early 90s uh, to own the copyright for Bind. And it, is, uh, it still exists, although I have left there in 2013 to pursue the work I'm going to describe today. Um, so I had a couple of different slide decks that were all keys that could fit the lock of uh, the, the abstract I sent. Uh, in other words, I, I tried to be as generic as possible about describing what I would talk about so that I could kind of lurk down there and listen to small talk and get to meet people so I could figure out exactly which audience this was. And I've dialed it all the way to the right. This is the absolutely most technical version of slides I have that fits the uh, description of the talk you were told to expect. Um, so I'll be telling a little bit of uh, history story, but. Uh, mostly what I want to say is I worked on DNS and BIND from sometime in the late 80s until, I don't know, uh, maybe 2008. Uh, so I hired the people who did BIND 9. I have no code in that package, so you should have no fear. Um, but the reason I stopped working on DNS was because I want to use DNS to secure other things rather than working on DNS itself and trying to secure DNS. So if you're here expecting me to talk about TSIG or any of the rest of that stuff, I'm sorry, that's not coming, but there's a bar, so we could talk after. What we're going to talk about here is the importance of DNS to everything else on the Internet and the benefits to you of monitoring and possibly controlling it. Um, and I have some demos, which I will give here at the end if there is time, uh, or I will give down there at those round tables to those of you who interested uh, if I run out of time here. Uh, so let's get started. There is an awful lot of DNS traffic in the world. Um, I've shown a snippet of a log file showing the three largest um, sensor operators that I deal with. These are people who operate a sensor like the one I'm going to describe to you. And they transmit their data to us uh, mostly so that it can be shared with other people like them. But we do also make commercial use of it. That's what paid for my air ticket to come here. Um, and what you should be able to see is that uh, there's an awful lot of bytes coming from an awful lot of servers, and that's just me. And I may run the largest network of this kind, but I'm still only seeing maybe on a good day a 20th of a percent of the total. Uh, the DNS is a very big thing. and There's a big business, a lot of people making a lot of money. Um, and the reason for this is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing kind of fell off the map. And so now there is nothing, there is no protocol on the internet that is in wide use and likely to be present in any of the devices in your pockets that isn't going to begin every online transaction with a DNS lookup. Um, and that makes it pretty important. So some people would say that if the internet were a territory, then the BGP, Border Gateway Protocol routing system, would be the map of that territory. And from a certain point of view, that is true if you're running routers. However, these IP addresses are not memorable, and in IPv6, even less so. Uh, so it's, these are not like telephone numbers. You are never, statistically speaking, going to remember the IP address of the service you want to talk to. And if you did, it's probably out of date. Or it's probably wrong for you, because if you looked it up by name, you'd go through a load balancer. But if you remember it by address, you're going to be getting a single machine somewhere that may not be close to you. Um, so really, the idea that we are going to hard code IP addresses is dead, and the idea that we're going to use something other than the DNS to find out the IP address we should be connecting to is dead. 
and DNS is increasingly used for other things, not just host name to IP address lookups, but also what is the mail server for this right-hand side, or uh, what, is the, what are the rules by which I can reject email because it didn't come from the right place. Uh, someday we're going to replace X509, and all of this TLS and SSL stuff that relies on the certificate authorities of the world will move into DNS as well. It's a very good system, it's very extensible, um, and it's very important. And if you're letting it go by uh, invisibly as something that mostly works and so you mostly don't worry about it, then you're like most of us because your hair is on fire for a different reason on any given day. Um, but I beg you to reconsider and to set aside some time this calendar year to look at your DNS, look at how you're doing it, and see if there are some things you could also do with it that would help you keep the rest of your assets more secure. So um, I mentioned BGP. I also want to mention NetFlow. Uh, NetFlow is a sampling protocol that runs inside of routers, and it just says, look, out of every thousand or so packets, I want to send one off to this control server somewhere so it can monitor what this router is doing. And even though that sounds like an absurdly low sampling rate, it turns out to be valid. You can get a lot of information about how your network behaves by looking at one out of a thousand or one out of 50,000 packets that they're going through your routers. Um, but it will only tell you what is happening. It will not explain why. You don't know why that IP address was chosen for that packet. And from a security point of view, you need to know both. So in DNS, you, you start to learn a lot more about the semantics of the packet rather than the syntax. So we added, back in bind version 8, uh, query logging. So that in the uh, namedb.conf file, you could name some file that was in your file system and say, I want a copy of every answer I send, which includes the question, so it's basically every transaction I answer, to be put into this ASCII file, one line per query. Um, and if you were working in the field back then, you'll realize that we were not innovators. This is what everybody was doing, and it made a lot of sense because it was like syslog. And to the extent that Splunk came along and gave us something constructive to do with all of those syslogs, it may even have made sense. But the problem is, you're writing to a file system that is backed by some physical device. Um, and with SSD, those physical devices have much better latency than they used to. But uh, still, there tended to be a bunch of kernel buffers that you would write into. Um, Bind wasn't aware of that. It was just using fprintf or something like that. But uh, ultimately, it was going into a bunch of kernel buffers. Uh, and when you ran out of those, then it had to wait for the device to catch up. And while it waited, you did not answer anything else because that, that fprintf you were doing was ultimately a synchronous system call called write that uh, just wouldn't return until it had had a chance to commit your data to system buffers that may not have been empty enough when you first entered. Um, so I have some graphs that show what that performance looks like if you turn on query logging. Um, and so obviously that was wrong-headed. Uh, it was one of those things where I probably added it and tested it, and it worked for running dig a few times, and I said, hey, look, I got output in the file, and so we shipped it. That does not mean that it worked in production or that anybody using it got good service as a result. Um, there is actually a large collection of uh, thorny problems behind that particular uh, curtain. And I'm going to talk about a few of them here because they inspired the work I'm describing. Um, so what we tended to do uh, once we found out that wasn't going to work is to use BPF. BPF is a kernel facility that feeds a library called libpcap, and that is in turn how the TCP dump command works. In other words, you're looking at the packets and trying to guess from the packets what DNS transactions were going on. Um, now, that was a lot easier when all of DNS was in UDP because one packet would be the query and another packet would be the response. Uh, but things got thorny uh, quick because first we had bigger responses than would fit in a packet. Uh, I did that. That was the eDNS protocol, and I'm sorry, um, because it resulted in IP fragmentation. And in an IP fragmentation world, the UDP headers are present in the first packet but they are not present in subsequent packets. And so you have to save a lot of state if you're going to uh, reassemble that stuff. And of course, the kernel does all of that state keeping because it needs to 
reassemble the fragmented things coming at it so we can deliver those to the read system call that we're then doing. Um, but here we are standing next to the packets. They're not being aimed at us. We're watching them go by and having to do all of that state keeping to do the reassembly of the packets. And uh, it turned out to be a mess. And what we have now is an increasing reliance on TCP, uh, which is to say you have even more state keeping because you have all those sequence numbers. Uh, doing this passively as a bystander has gotten harder over time. Um, I was responsible for some software called NCAP, uh, which is still out there, but not, not widely used, uh, which tried to do what I just described. It did that reassembly of the, of the, the fragments, and it did the, re the reconnection of transactions uh, and generated a file. And the great thing about NCAP or anything else that's based on BPF is that if you can't keep up, it doesn't slow the server down. It just means you don't get everything. And if that's the choice you have to make, you know, do I want to slow down to the speed with which I can record, or do I want to record with less fidelity when I'm not keeping up? Most of us who are running servers that have got users that know our phone numbers are going to say, I want, to, I want the service to be reliable even if I miss some packets. And that also creates some problems, because if you're not going to get it all, you have to be careful about what you're not getting. You have to be, in other words, constructive in how you lose. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, my code got thrown out. I hired a 20-something, and he looked at it and said, this is crap, and rewrote it all. He was right. Uh, and so now we do everything we do with endmessage, and this is all open source. And so you can find it on GitHub. It's very portable. Uh, it can be the basis of virtually any experiments I can imagine you doing in this area because uh, we keep it up to date, and it's the basis of everything we do. And as far as I know, there's nobody doing more complicated stuff in DNS research than we are. So this is a uh, kind of a orbital version. This is what you would get if you took an orbital photograph of DNS. Uh, so you cannot see the details, but you can see the big blocks. Your stub resolver is here in your phone or in your laptop or your virtual machine or your physical machine, your router, your IoT device. It's where queries come into the DNS. Now those queries are sent to a recursive server, and there is a recursive server in this building that you were told the address of when you signed on to the, uh, the Wi-Fi. You don't have to use the one it gives you, but it will give you one that will generally work uh, for some value of work if you're in China. But um, the idea is you're sending the query to somebody close uh, that is trustworthy, and the path between you and that recursive server is short and easy to protect. It doesn't have a lot of people watching the packets on it that are not your friends. Um, and the other benefit of having one of these close to you is it has a cache. So if one of you has already asked for www.google.com and I ask a few minutes later, I will get a very rapid answer because I'll get a copy of the one you got. Now that cache is of limited size and the DNS is not of limited size, so you can imagine there's some management, uh, least recently used discard and other things that you have to do to that cache because not everything that people are interested in is going to fit pretty much no matter how many megabytes or gigabytes you give, it will not be enough. But that's okay, because you only care about the stuff that is requested often enough that not having it would be a problem on average. So in other words, uh, hotspot cache is good enough, and it is the presence of that cache that has allowed DNS almost unchanged to scale from 1986, when there were 300 universities and 75 government contractors connected to NSFNet, to now, where we have three billion people using the internet every day, and it's, yes, we've changed the DNS protocol a lot, but we haven't changed this model. It really did scale more orders of magnitude than any technology in the history of humanity. So if you meet Paul Macapetris, you owe him a beer. Now, if I mentioned the cache because uh, it's very important for us uh, as data collectors. Uh, all of the data between your stub resolver and that recursive has your IP address. And anyone who knows your IP address can probably figure out what MAC address was using that IP address at that time. And once they know your MAC address, if they stop you and frisk you and grab your cell phone, they can get it to tell them that that MAC address belongs to you. And once you're doing that, it really is PII, personally identifiable information. And I hate that. I don't have any. I don't collect it. I don't want it on my network. Uh, and you should defend it uh, fiercely and help others do likewise.
Um, but if you ask that, quest that same server a question that no one has recently asked it, and it cannot therefore satisfy you from cache, it's going to go upstream to the authority servers. Uh, the authority servers, uh, just as the stubs is where questions come into the DNS, the authority servers is where answers come into the DNS. And if you've used bind, you know that it's an authority server and it's got zone files and you edit them with your favorite text editor and uh, tell the server to reload them and that's how data gets into the DNS. And pretty much that's it. Those are the three types of protocol speakers the DNS has. And what I want you to notice is that uh, we have Farsight as my company, and uh, we collect a lot of data. That's what that um, uh, email snippet about the number of bytes was, was from. We collect a lot of data, but we collect it from above the recursive, not below. So we never know the IP address of someone who asked a question. And to the extent that uh, some DNS questions are one-time events, right? Because you, as a web user, were handed all kinds of cookies and one-by-one -one pixels and all sorts of things. And one of the things you were handed was a unique, random-looking subdomain of some domain so that if anyone ever asked that question, they would know it was you. So there, that is a PII leak. And I have a team who works on finding them and filtering them out before it makes it into our database because I don't want that stuff. And you shouldn't either. Uh, but it's not just a database. You can do an awful lot of other analysis besides storing this. But storing it is, uh, I guess, the thing that paid for my airplane ticket. So that'll be the demo I give later. Um, so there are some problems. One is, I mentioned cache management. Um, so if all you're doing is looking at the packets, as we do with nMessage, uh, as everybody does with BPF, because this whole thing with uh, writing to disk uh, died when, when things got big. Um, so if all you're doing is looking at the packets, then there are a number of off-the-wire events that you will be blind to. You don't know, for example, that something got discarded from the cache because the cache filled up, or got discarded from the cache because the time to live field expired and it was just had to go get, get a fresh copy. You don't know why. All you see is a repeated query for the same data, and you have to guess about why that query was repeated. Um, and that's a problem for security. You need to know why a query occurred, not just that it occurred. Um, so that's one problem that you have by looking at packets. Um, another is that you don't know whether this query uh, is important as metadata or it's important as data. There may be somebody below you who needs to know what the address of a name server is, and it may be that that's a policy violation, and you will not be able to tell why that happened because there's no tagging of the intent of the query. Um, and finally, uh, with TLS and everything else that's happening now, D DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTP, which I recommend against, by the way, um, you can't really look at the packets on the wire unless you know the keys. Uh, so you be you're, we're becoming more and more blind to packets uh, or to the DNS transactions. So something else had to be done. Um, but before I tell you what we did, I want to uh, give Van Jacobsen the, the deserved shout out for this picture. Um, if you are collecting things very quickly and then you're trying to upload them and you cannot upload them all, then some of it is going to be lost. And so one of the problems we decided we were going to solve when we moved away from looking at packets was to be more constructive about what we didn't keep. Um, because if you don't know what you're not keeping, then you can't predict what you didn't see. So a lot of this becomes a gang of statistics, especially if you're running it through TensorFlow and trying to do machine learning on it. So we created two technologies. And I say we because it was people at my company, but we open sourced them. They're on GitHub. They now have much larger teams than the small number of people who created them. One of them is called DNS Tap. The other one is called Frame Streams. Uh, so DNS Tap is inside the name server. So you're no longer looking at the packets generated by the name server, trying to guess why they're there and what they mean. You're actually getting a, a library call from inside the name server that says, this is, what I, this is the question I got, this is the answer I sent, and this is why. Um, and Framestreams was a necessary transport component to get that data out. Uh, because again, we're not just going to write it to a file. We know that that, that way lies madness. Um, and we would have liked to maybe simply write it out to a UDP port. That is how um, NetFlow works. Uh, 
Uh, but again, that becomes a problem if that UDP port might be local, might be distant, might be firewalled, uh, might be observed by people that you, you don't trust. Uh, so we decided to create a transport for this kind of information that had the semantics of loss that we liked um, and also gave us all of the options we needed about where the other end of this data was, you know, where it was going after it left the name server. Um, so this all happened about, I don't know, three or four years ago. And uh, this is now present in any open source name server you can install. Um, we have not yet got Microsoft to do it, and Akamai, who bought Nominum, has not yet done it, because of course they all have their own proprietary ways to share this telemetry, and they're not sure that we can cause them to lose market share by building this big open source thing around them. Uh, so you can help me by just installing this, but uh, I'll get to that later. So again, this is server embedded. And um, that means you're not guessing what the question was. You've got a name server telling you what question it was answering. Um, as a little side note, there's a big problem with bailiwick detection, right? If there, are, let's say that uh, you have a name server somewhere that is responsible for both a zone and one of its subzones. So imagine, I don't know, example.com and foo.example.com have the same authority server. You cannot easily guess when you see a packet sent to that server, what bailiwick the, the, the requester thought they were operating in. In other words, did, did I send this to that server because it's responsible for example.com or did I send it because it's responsible for foo.example.com? That information isn't on the wire, but the server knows. The, the thing generating the question knows that and it puts that into this payload and that helps us a lot when we're analyzing what happened. Um, and let's see here, I mentioned the, the various things you don't see from OnWire, like uh, if there is a cache dismissal, something got purged for some reason, it can tell you that, uh, which means it's capable of reporting on things that are not DNS transactions. There will be other activities inside the name server you would also like to be able to observe. Um, and finally, you know, we did not want to innovate unnecessarily. Google did a very good job on protocol buffers, which you can think of as like a cleaner version of ASN1 or a binary version of JSON or however you want to think about it. It is the fastest way I know of to portably encode a bunch of numeric data and send it to somebody else whose machine word size and byte order are different. Uh, it's a very cool system. It's hard to work with, but uh, since we were using it in other areas, we used it here, and it is all open source. Google doesn't want a license fee, and there's a JSON version and a JavaScript version and a Java version and a C and C++. It's, it's out there. So um, it, it's, it's part of the burden we ask people to adopt when they run DNS tap, but it's the smallest burden we could think of. So uh, I've already mentioned the uh, things associated with off-wire information. Um, and for that, I want you to consider that there is now a protocol option by which a server can put its fingerprint into a response. Because with any cast, you don't necessarily know which server you were talking to on a given transaction. And so with NSID, that's an option in the protocol, a client can uh, request that the server please identify itself because if uh, there's a problem with this, I want to know how to report the problem, who to report it to. Well. That isn't universally deployed, so we put that in here as well, so that if you're monitoring uh, at this level, you can figure out as much as possible uh, what server generated the question and what server uh, responded to that, that question. Um, also, there are different reasons, right? Uh, uh, this recursive server I told you about responds to queries from stubs, but it also generates queries to its authority. Now, I don't want to see your PII, but you probably do, right? No employee has a reasonable expectation of privacy when using the company's equipment. You probably want to log those queries that are going to the stubs, but um, in DNS tap, if you turn that on, you'll see that they actually have a different transaction tag so that you can quickly decide whether this was a below the recursive or an above the recursive transaction. Um, so we're trying to facilitate as much as possible a da data analytics marketplace around the DNS protocol because it is so important. Um, 
But again, uh, this is all about observation, not eavesdropping. There is no way that DNS tap can be used for surveillance because the person who is running it has to turn it on deliberately. This is not something that your government can do behind your back like a passive optical splitter in the wiring closet. So uh, again, although we want the internet to be better observed, we do not want that observation to take the, uh, the form of surveillance. So I want to talk a little more about Framestream. Again, we had to invent this transport because there wasn't one that did what we wanted. And part of the problem is the way TCP works, part of it is the way UDP works, and part of it is the way the Sockets API in Linux and BSD work. Um, so being aware of all of those gotchas, we came up with something that would uh, sort of neatly avoid um, all of the horns of that dilemma. Um, if you send more data than a UDP socket can accept, in other words, you're back to that Van Jacobson diagram and you are generating data at you know, 10 megabits per second, but the uh, UDP socket is uh, going over a link that is one megabit per second, there's going to be some loss. And the great thing about that loss in the case of UDP is that it will be uh, entire packets. In other words, if you try to write more than the kernel socket buffer has got room for, it will reject the entire packet that you're trying to commit to that socket buffer. With TCP, you don't get that behavior. It accepts what it can and gives you back the rest. So you can easily uh, be talking to a TCP socket and try to write 100 bytes and be told, I took 80 of them, but the last 20 you better send next. And if you don't send those 20 as the very next thing you ever do, then you've probably broken whatever protocol that TCP socket was expecting you to speak. So I have asked the various people inside the BSD and Linux communities if they could please give us at atomic rejection of TCP rights. Uh, and one of them did, but it's so not portable that we can't depend on it yet. Um, I, we, we will keep working in that area. Um, so what we decided to do is to create this thing that would sit above that kernel socket, that kernel socket buffer, uh, and do the atomic rejection in user mode. Um, so it relies on a lockless single provider, single consumer ring buffer. Uh, and I say lockless because we don't have time to be uh, sort of messing around with mutexes and, and thread, p-thread context at the speeds we're operating. Um, and we are talking to a blocking socket. So uh, when you write to it, you can block. And so that's just inevitable. Uh, however, those writes are always thing of things that just went through a ring buffer. Here, I have a picture. Um, so the idea is you're committing whole messages to a circular queue and somebody else is trying to bucket out that queue, and they are only going to bucket out that queue one queue entry at a time, which is to say it's atomic. And uh, if it blocks, it blocks. And that means if you keep writing to the queue, it will be discarding the things that you're trying to add to the queue or maybe constructively discarding something else if you want tail drop instead of uh, head drop. Uh, but the idea is that the blocking is now a feature, not a bug, because we added this extra layer in front of it. Uh, it does unfortunately rely on threads. So if you're familiar with various name servers, you know that uh, Unbound is uh, able to be threaded and NSD is not. These are two name servers that come from Amsterdam. Um, and as a result, Unbound speaks this protocol and NSD doesn't because it's using fork instead of thread. And uh, they're gonna have to redo their whole IO system to support this. But that's okay because this is much more valuable on the recursive server, which is what Unbound is, than it is on an authority server uh, where, frankly, you may need a, a list of the qu questions you got in case a customer complains, uh, but that's really, really unlikely. So these are the message types we know of, uh, various types of queries, uh, and various types of other things that might come later. Uh, if you're discarding queries because it looks like it's part of a DDoS, then you're running response rate limiting. That's something you'd like to know. And we do put that in the syslog using res when response rate limiting is occurring. Um, but we didn't see a reason to make you keep using syslog for some things and then get DNS tap for others. So uh, we just uh, made sure that uh, we had the, the ability to someday add everything you might need, such as a zone transfer has started or ended, or a cache purge event has occurred, which I mentioned earlier. So here, as promised, is what happens if you turn on query logging in bind 9. Um, 
So what's happening here is uh, your system utilization, sort of how many CPU cycles are doing something rather than idle, uh, is on the uh, vertical, and the number of questions you're answering per second is on the horizontal. Uh, so if you're just using bind 9 without query logging, you can see that uh, as the number of queries you're answering goes up, the system utilization goes up, and when it hits about 1.0, then it doesn't get faster. No more queries per second can occur, uh, and it does not use more than 100% of the system because that would violate the laws of physics and math. So that is, it's not beautiful. It would be better if it went further before it saturated your system, and more recent versions of bind will go further and are sort of less vertical than this. But once you turn on query logging to a file system uh, outcome, then you can see that buffer cache uh, hurting you. You will reach 80% of utilization, and <laughs> you will never reach 200,000 queries a second. And that's just because it's spending all of its time waiting for a write system call that is behind an fprintf library call to finish. So this is exactly what we expected. Now, after we got DNS tap working, we put it into unbound first because I was part of ISC. The bind, bind was our thing, and I really didn't want to look like bind was all we cared about. So this is one of the times we did something non-bind before we did the bind version. And so uh, with unbound, you can see in the blue that uh, it uh, gets a lot further, a lot more queries per second before it saturates the CPU. Uh, but you can also see that once you start turning on DNS tap, just having it uh, turned, you know, existing in the server but disabled slows you down a little bit, right? Just having that config knob. It's one more test you have to do as part of answering a query. And so the light blue is a little bit less uh, attractive than the dark blue. Uh, once you turn it on, but say, look, I want you to assemble all the messages, but don't do anything with them, discard them, that's the green, and you can see, again, it is not as many queries per second, but it doesn't have any saturation point. Finally, if you turn it on right into a hard drive or right into a, a file on your file system, that's the red, and you can see it is the least attractive, but it's really not that bad compared to what Bind was doing. So um, we treated this as success. So we're using the Apache open source license for all of this, uh, sometimes called AOSL2. Um, and that's not because uh, BSD license, which is what ISC started with, or the ISC license, was not beautiful. It just was not as beautiful as the Apache license. They paid better lawyers than we did. So the AOSL2 license is, it gives you BSD-like semantics in terms of people making derivative works, but it protects everybody better against liability. Um, but the point is it's open and that all of this is on GitHub and you can use it or contribute to it the way that you can on anything else that's on GitHub. Maybe even more so because there's no GNU virus going on there. You're not forced to share your changes if you make a, a, a derivative work, for example. Um, and it's in, again, it's, I didn't mention PowerDNS, but it is in every open source name server that you could want at this stage. We've, I've spent four years on an airplane making sure that this got around. Uh, I will circle back to Microsoft at some point and remind them that the DNS analytics market does not include them and they really need to add this cheap, easy, open source thing to their name servers. And the same for Akamai who bought Nominum. Um, and there's a website, dnstap.info, that will tell you sort of everything I just said plus maybe more technical details. Um, so I want to explain a little bit about why we did this, and I cannot make a commercial pitch. This is not a show where vendors get to hawk their wares. So I just really want to say everything I've described is license. It's open source license. You don't owe us a nickel every time you use it or anything like that. And as far as how we do what we do, we collect all this data and uh, we trade, right? If somebody wants to buy the data from us commercially, we do that. If they want to trade data, like they're willing to run a sensor and they want access to what we do with their data, we do that. So uh, we even have a number of academic users who had nothing to offer in trade and they still get it for free. So uh, please do not treat this as a, a commercial pitch. This is me trying to align my company's interests with the interests of the overall economy so that I am additive rather than extractive to, the, to that economy. Um, so we're gathering this data and we've got uh, 200,000 of those cache misses every second from around the world. 
Um, I don't know if anybody has more. Uh, Google might have more, but they have a privacy policy that set, promises not to do what we do. So um, I, I, I can't look at their data and find out what percent of them would, would be us. Um, but we have a whole bunch of real-time channels, and sometimes all you care about is newly observed domain names or newly observed delegation points or differences you know, where some DNS change has occurred. Or other times you might need to look at a database uh, so that you can find out, gee, I got spammed, uh, or my, probably my CFO got spammed if it's somebody in this room, um, and they clicked on something they shouldn't have, they got infected. The domain name that was in the email is gone now and I need to know what it said when it was alive, but it's been taken down. Somebody else complained about it. Uh, the history is in this database. Once you find out what it pointed to, you can ask contextual cross-reference questions, like uh, what are all the other domain names that have pointed to that IP or to an IP in the same net block? What are all the other domain names that had the same name server? What are all the name servers that had the same IP or the, in the same net block? Whole bunch of cross-referencing that you get to do which kind of uh, takes the clothes off the attack and lets you see them naked, which is not pretty, but nevertheless helpful. Um, as you know, who is is crap and getting worse, uh, thanks to GDPR, but please do not blame GDPR for the death of who is. You have to blame ICANN and the commercial constituency because they want to sell domains as fast as they can and they don't want their customers to be accountable because that would slow down the rate of new domain sales. So you have to look uh, beyond GDPR to find out who to blame for the, the uselessness of who is. But the point is, who is was never accurate. It didn't have to be accurate. You put the wrong address, phone number, name, uh, whatever email address, put, it, put that in there and the domain will still work. DNS is not like that. If you put the wrong information into DNS, then you cannot effectively attack people because they can't find your server or they can't figure out how to validate the answer or whatever that is. Um, and so I just want to say, uh, we cannot do what Who is used to promise, where you'd start out with an indicator and end up with the home address of the person who did it so that you can send them, a, I don't know, a lawsuit or a police van or whatever is on your mind there. Uh, I don't promise that. DNS doesn't have that information. What I can promise, uh, and what you should want, is the ability to take one indicator and turn it into an asset cloud, which is the fingerprint of the bad guy. If, if he attacks you again, it'll be with the very, very similar fingerprint. You'll know it's the same person. You don't know who it is, but when you catch up to them, you'll know exactly what they did. And that's what we do. Again, that's, how, that's what paid for me to come here, because there are commercial users of all of this, not just universities and internet superheroes. On the other hand, if you are interested in crime fighting uh, in your off hours after you get done cross uh, crime fighting during your day job, and you want access to this, uh, my email address is widely known. I get more spam than anybody I know. Please contact me. Tell me what you're going to do with it. Tell me if you can possibly get somebody somewhere to run a sensor, and I will give you a license key, because I want the Internet to be safer. I have kids. Um, so um, if after Q&A we have a few minutes left, I'm going to give a demonstration of some of this. Um, but uh, I'm a little ahead of schedule, so we could do that now. But um, let me just stop right here while all of this is still on your mind, give you a chance to take a picture of all these URLs, although this video will be public and the slides probably also, uh, so you don't need to take a picture of it necessarily, but I'd love to know what you think about all this. Which problems do you have that this doesn't solve but seem closely related and thus I am an idiot for not having covered them? Uh, the question is, can you run your own? And the answer is yes. Um, mo a lot of our software that we use for DNSDB is open source, so it's a good construction kit. There is also a fairly well-known uh, passive DNS database solution that uses ELK, which is Elasticsearch something in Logstash, Logstash and yeah. Um, and that a lot of people are using and they're liking it. But the sad thing is looking at a database of the part of the DNS that your server has witnessed is boring because it will not tell you, you can't cross-reference anything you didn't see. So um, you really are going to need a database bigger than the one in your house. Um, and that's why I created one. If it was possible to do this at the enterprise or in a small office, home office level, I would have done it that way. 
But what I, you know, let me, uh, I, I want more hands to go up, so I'm going to turn up the controversy knob. Um, there are other things besides the database that you can do if you're observing DNS coming out of your server. Uh, for example, a new domain name is probably created by some spammer or criminal. It's probably not going to live long. Um, and it's useful if you want to drive down the false positive rate to see what was new to other people as well so that you get a chance to say, um, like at my house, none of my kids nor my wife are able to look up a domain name that was first observed by Farsight in the last 10 minutes. And there's a fair amount of complexity behind the curtains that creates that. Um, but uh, that saves us a lot of spam and a lot of malware because a lot of this stuff only lasts 10 minutes because it gets killed by some complaint or it gets listed in Spam House or something else. Um, so that, that first 10 minutes turns out to be critical. Um, but even without a large cloud of observers and even without a database that is showing what was new to that large cloud, just looking at what's new to you should be interesting because if, if you're about to look up a name that you have, your server has never looked up before, um, you might ask the question, is this still going to exist 24 hours from now? Wouldn't I like to gray list it and fa fail the, 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 the query and just say no and just let it ripen? for a little while and see if 24 hours from now that, uh, that, that, that question can still be answered because the server that's responsible for it is still up. You can do that with this technology and a, you know, a little bit of Perl scripting or Python or Go or whatever it is that, that you like. Yes, sir? The question is, is uh, sort of the, the size of my, or, uh, let's broaden it, not just my uh, technology base, but the technology base in general. Um, so Google runs 8.8.8.8, and IBM runs 9.9.9.9, and Cloudflare runs 1.1.1, and they're spending a lot of money uh, on the people, the hardware, the software, the operations, the bug fixing, the, uh, the monitoring, the network connectivity, the power, and they're giving it to you for free. Right? None, none of us is paying any of those people when we use those name services. Um, I leave it to you to ponder what their motivation for operating that service might be, given that they're not getting any money from you uh, for, for running it. Um, so those services, uh, which I consider unfortunate, right? In the 80s, we all ran our own name servers and thought nothing of it. And then in the 90s, ISP started to run them for us, and we thought, well, that's, I guess, convenient, even though it's a little slower than having one on my LAN with me. And in the aughts, OpenDNS decided that they would anycast the whole thing, and then Google caught up with it. And so now everybody thinks anycast is how DNS works. It doesn't. You don't need this. Uh, there's a device called a Pi Hole that uh, is a Raspberry Pi with a built-in software that just does this. It costs very little. Um, nevertheless, uh, there is a fair amount of sheep DNA built into the human genome, and uh, a lot of people just use those anycast servers and by my estimate, they've got maybe 40% of the market. Because um, a lot of people do not care about this. They use their ISP, or they use their university, or they use their companies. Or they, maybe they just use their Linksys box or whatever, because those often have DNS MASQ, which I don't know how to, how to pronounce. Uh, they often have that built into it. So a lot of people don't care about this. And the ones that do tend to use whatever uh, four, four numbers with three dots uh, they last heard about. And so that's a, that's a huge part of it. So of the part that is not using those, so the, the, the remaining 60%, I would say less than 10% does the analytics that I'm talking about. And I need to drive that number higher. Even if it isn't using my technology or you know, using my services, I need people to look at this stuff. Because if all, all of those people out there on the internet are trivially pwnable, that means we are less safe. Uh, there's no, no way that we can decouple our safety from the safety of the herd that we're in any more than we could by uh, adopting some anti-vaccine campaign. Other questions? Yes, sir. I mentioned that I was not a fan of DNS over HTTPS. Um, now, DNS over TLS is a perfectly reasonable engineering solution to a real problem that I admit the world had. Um, and if you want to use DNS over TLS, then um, may the wind be at your back. Um, all that does, by the way, it's, it's, it's DNS over TCP, but it begins with a TLS negotiation. Um, now, because DNS is often used to reach an X509 
uh, registry to go look for a revocation certificate, for example, uh, you really can't have uh, both TLS depending on DNS and DNS depending on TLS. And so there were some tricks that they had to work out about being able to learn to trust the other guy without using a certificate authority to do it. So this is a di slightly different and I think better uh, way of doing TLS than what the web would normally use, but it's all in the library. You don't have to write the code to do this, you just have to trust the people who did or uh, that, uh, that has been adequately um, reviewed. Um, so another great advantage of DNS over TLS is uh, you probably don't need to close the connection, right? With DNS over port 53, the old DNS over TCP protocol that's existed for all these decades, um, the server uh, will close the connection on you if you go idle for about two minutes. Um, or if it'll probably close it faster and violate the two minute rule if it runs out of TCP sockets and it is afraid that other people are not getting service. Uh, so all of that was dealt with on TCP over port 853, which is the, what's used for the TLS. Um, and so the, and to, the expectation is that your server will let that connection stay open forever. And so once your stub resolver has successfully negotiated with the recursive or the recursive has successfully negotiated with the authority, they can use that connection forever. Um, at least they'll be able to keep 50 or 60,000 of them. Eventually you run out of TCP control block storage in the kernel or you run out of file descriptors uh, or something else happens, but um, it really was pretty well thought out. One other thing that they fixed was the head of line blocking problem. In DNS over TCP, you have to answer the questions in the order they arrived. Um, and that means that if somebody asks you something, some stub asks you something, and the authority is real slow, it's taking you five or ten seconds to get the answer, um, then anybody else who asks a question over that same TCP se uh, session is going to be waiting for that first one before they can get their answer, even if the answer was available in cache or available more quickly. DNS over TLS does away with that as well. It can answer things in any order. So it's a good, solidly designed protocol that took years of argument in the IETF working group, uh, full of DNS people, and uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's harsh because it adds complexity, but it was the best complexity we could come up with. DNS over HTTPS is precisely none of those things. It came out of the web community, who was very angry about the Edward Snowden disclosures, and they want to encrypt everything, and they don't want any of their user traffic to ever be modified or uh, intercepted or, uh, or monitored in any way, and uh, they are not DNS people, and they do not understand, for example, anything I just said about monitoring your DNS to look for bad things. And there's a whole other talk I could have given today about controlling having policy about what you're willing to resolve and what you're not, because you know where the domain generation algorithm botnets are today, and you're just not going to let your users touch them. So there's a lot about control that I didn't touch on today. I, I stuck to monitoring. Um, but the people in the web community who develop DNS over HTTPS are completely oblivious to all of that. Uh, they believe that they need to build technology that will uh, accommodate a hostile network operator who is going to replace your DNS with things pointing to their advertising servers or is going to monitor what you do and send it off to some human rights violation team somewhere. Uh, and so rather than tell you to use VPNs or tell you to use Tor, they decided to build DNS into the web browser. Now let me explain that your web browser is not the only thing that cares to look up names. There are many helper applications. Sometimes the web browser has to fork and exec something else which will not know what the DNS lookup result was inside the web browser. It will try to do its own, and it will not have access to whatever DNS over HTTPS thing that the web browser used, and so it might get a different answer. It might even be using a local naming system where you've got sort of .home or .local or some other thing that only works if you use the local name server. Um, I tried pretty hard to talk to the people at the Mozilla Foundation who were pushing this thing really hard, and I've talked to the Google people about uh, why 8.8 .8 supports it and why Chrome and Android are going to support it. And uh, they, all they can think about is some uh, activist somewhere getting clobbered by their secret police because their DNS was modified. They don't understand that in an enterprise context or 
any other trusted, and if you're in my house, I'm doing DNS in a way that protects the other things you might be able to reach when you're in my house. In other words, DNS is part of my control plane. It's also true at my office and most of your day jobs. And the idea that your web browser is going to silently go over the top of all of that and ask some distant, untrusted entity like Cloudflare to resolve this name for us. And by the way, it will have its own TCP session to Cloudflare, so they'll know exactly which device it came from. It's not going to go through any kind of a collection and uh, uh, many-to-one service. Um, the, the idea that those employees, those visitors, those BYOD devices are all going to be able to do precisely whatever the hell the web community wants them to be able to do and that you as a network operator are now the enemy offends me deeply. And I have been on the phone to members of the Internet Architecture Board, which is supposed to be the grown-ups in charge over there, to say, maybe you shouldn't have uh, rubber-stamped this one, boys and girls. Few girls, uh, not enough girls, I think. Anyway, uh, nobody cares, because Edward Snowden flew to Hong Kong, and now that's the agenda. So DNS over HTTPS is going to set back Internet security at least 10 years and we will all get less sleep as long as we continue in this field because of that thing which was done by well-meaning ignorant people from the web universe who don't know a damn thing about DNS. Thank you for asking, by the way. <laughs> More hands. Ah, all right then. I'm sorry for what you're about to have to watch. This is a Windows machine. Uh, uh -huh. And I think, let's try this. Uh, hey, look at that. So there's a database, and it is fed by this uh, very interesting front end. It's getting 200,000 operations per second and crushing them down into something that can be fully indexed. That used to be hard. Now you can sort of buy that off the shelf. But we're not using any of the standard uh, NoSQL databases. We did all of this on our own because in 2010, commercially off, commercial off-the-shelf technology could not do uh, what you see now. Um, uh, I should probably have set this up uh, before. <laughs> All right, we're not doing that. Um, let's do, it, do this a different way. Um, again, I'm sorry you have to watch this part. I should unplug it so that this video doesn't become X-rated with all of this uh, Windows stuff all over it, but um, there we go. Uh, hey, it worked. All right. Um, Let's see here. All right, now we're ready. Can you read this? All right. Um, let's uh, make it bigger anyway in case the people on the video would like to read it. Change settings. I do most of my work in a Linux VM, um, but that is hard to change the font size on, so I decided I would do this the hard way, or the easy way, depending on how you look at it. Doot, doot. Okay. So there's a database, as I said, uh, that collects this stuff, and uh, it has a RESTful API. Uh, if I look for, oh, let's see, let's look at my own domain. Um, uh, dash J. Um, oh, if this doesn't work, we're, oh, red barred. Ha! That's not going to happen. Not going to work. I don't know why it was so slow, but it's certainly not going to work if I use the wrong name. Ah, there we go. So you can see that there is a JSON output here. We can pretty print it with, I guess, JQ, um, so that you can get some sense of what the database contains. I was asking for uh, entries by RR name, in other words, the owner of something, and I was restricting it to just the MX record type. And um, you can see that our system successfully guessed the bailiwick, 
And that's because redbarn.org and .org are not served by the same name server, so we were able to disambiguate just by looking at the packets. That's becoming more rare. Uh, and you can see that the answer is some server called SS. Um, yes, I did move to the Soviet Union after I sold VIX.com. I bought a sports car with the money, and I bought property in the Soviet Union decades after it was dead. So I feel like a good Cold Warrior today. So um, this is a uh, database that has a lot of other features to it. If we say, instead of asking for the uh, owner name, if we say, I'm going to give you the answer, and I would like you to tell me where that answer has been used, and let's allow it to give us five answers instead of one, then you get the permuted index. I'm telling you the MX record. I want you to tell me what uses it. Now, JSON is kind of boring, so let's turn that part off. Let's get rid of JQ, get rid of dash J. The default output for this tool is to convert that JSON that is coming from the server into something that would normally fit in a zone file because I wrote this tool and I like this format. Uh, we do have people who hate this format, and so for them, we are able to turn it into CSV so they can import it into Microsoft Excel. But the point is, um, this can be used either to fingerprint a bad actor, because you know what name, mail server they were using, uh, or what name server they were using. You know something that they were using, and you want to know what they were using it for. Um, now, this data is old because, as I told you, I sold uh, uh, some of the servers that, uh, that, that went into this to buy a sports car. Um, but if it was new, then you'd see data right up to the minute, and it might be that the old data is useful and the new data is not. There are, therefore, many options um, in the API which are all reflected in this tool. So you can actually say, I only care about answers that occurred after or before or both various times, and you can sort by various things. There's a whole lot you can do. Um, I'll give you one other example, because we're running out of minutes here. Uh, let's take a look at the history of the IP address for farsightsecurity.com. Um, and of course, I have to tell it whether I'm doing a left-hand or right-hand lookup, or it will fail. So there we go. That's the whole thing. I didn't limit it. So you can see that uh, we were incorporated in 2013. and. Uh, nothing exists before then because we had to create these assets. But you can also see that we've cycled through a number of different IP addresses during that time. So let's imagine for a moment that we were a criminal enterprise and uh, you were wondering who was hosting us uh, before 2015. So you might do this, oops, or this. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, in order to get, again, the permuted answer. I'm telling you the answer. I want you to tell me the questions that led to it. And if that is not exciting, because uh, .81 looks pretty tame, and what you're wondering is who else were they were hosting, then you can broaden it to a net block. And yes, it really is this fast. That is not a rigged demo. In fact, it barely works at all uh, from this Wi-Fi. But in any case, I can get some sense of uh, who else was in the slash 24, and if I constrain it by time, I can even get it to tell me only the ones that were hosted at the same time. This is, to me, a necessary tool for anybody doing either DNS research, security research, incident response, defense, uh, forensics, any of it. Um, and I will give you an API key if you run a server, or I'll sell you an API key if you want to use it commercially, and that's my pitch. And we are pretty much at the end of the hour, but if there's one last question, I will squeeze it in. Oh, come on. I'm sorry, louder? It, the sports car is a Mazda Miata. Uh, they call it an MX-5, and it was the 2016 launch edition, uh, which is supposed to be a collector's item, because they it was the, the so-called fourth uh, architecture for the ND. It's a very fun car, but it is too safe. It, it, it could not possibly explode or go over a cliff, so I'll probably have to move back to a Datsun. Thank you all for your time today.